Your business needs help. 56.1 million employees are employed by small businesses in the United States, and 99% of all U.S. establishments are small businesses under 250 employees. That means that your business should be listening to the only podcast dedicated to small business success. That's Growth Success Radio, growthsuccessradio.com. Welcome to this week's episode of Growth Success Radio. Welcome, everybody, to Growth Success Radio. Eugene, this is episode 50, the big 5-0. 50, woo. Right? It took us a little longer than a year to get there, but um, this is the only live podcast, live video podcast, where we talk to small business owners and small business owner support people. And uh, this show is co-sponsored by Traeger Insurance. That's Eugene over there with the TR Insurer. There you go, Traeger Insurance. And Scott Gumbar, Digital Marketing Agency. And like I said, we are live every Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern. And uh, this week we have Bridget Mayer. We're going we're gonna to talk to her very shortly. She's got a very interesting story. And she's got a book we just found out. Show us the book, mm-hmm. The Art Cure. So this is, uh, we've had a few authors on now. So here's yeah. another book for you guys to add to your collection. To listen to and watch past and or watch past shows, you can go to growthsuccessradio.com or you could go to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, Facebook, a bunch of other places. Eugene shows, Eugene plays these episodes on his TV every Saturday morning in his house. If you stand outside, he's got a 70-inch TV. You could just stand outside and watch it from there. Instead of Saturday morning cartoons, I play our show. You like seeing your face that big. <laughs> he does, actually. <laughs> um, so, like I said, we are co-sponsored by Traeger Insurance, so Eugene is going to provide an insurance update for us today. Or he's going to tell us about Traeger Insurance first. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> uh, down. Friday. I know you want to go and go to your karate class. No, not today. Not today. That was yesterday. That was yesterday. All right. So, Traeger Insurance, we are an independent insurance agency based out of Meriden, Connecticut, serving pretty much Connecticut, a little bit in New York, and a little Massachusetts business. What independent means is very simple, is that we speak insurance so you don't have to. Um, our goal is to find the best coverage for the most optimal price for our clients, regardless of what company it is. My role within the agency is president of commercial lines, so I primarily deal with business owners for their commercial insurance needs. Awesome, Eugene. And like I said, I own a digital marketing agency, and all that means is I use things like Google and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, Google AdWords and Facebook ads and all those fun things to drive traffic, revenue, and profit to your business. And um, I do that with a smile on my face. I don't really smile that much, but I pretend (laughs) to be. So um, now you can do your update, Eugene. So my update today is more of a public service announcement to all the homeowners out in the world. When they hire a contractor, please make sure they are insured. If they are not insured, please get a liability waiver done. You can get those from LegalZoom or you can hire an attorney to get that because if the contractor falls off your roof, uh, he can actually sue you. Because, for example, if you even give the contractor a tool or the ladder, you can be deemed as negligent by an attorney or a court of law for their injuries. So make sure you do those two things. So Eugene and I have a lot of attorney friends, and Eugene just referred people to LegalZoom. Correct. Yeah. Gonna have to. I'm gonna see some of them today, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to talk to them. None of our none of our attorneys will do that, by the way. The liability waivers. Maybe, maybe Fournier will do it, but Google doesn't do it because I asked him, and he didn't refer 
the, the client to Fournier or anybody like that. So I don't think any of our attorneys actually do them. Legal Zoom. Okay. All right. Um, for me, we're going to have to work on this one, Eugene. Instagram Live. So Instagram, Instagram live? live is live. Instagram Live is live. There you go. So uh, we're going to have to figure out how we can now stream to Instagram as well. Uh, because I was sent an infographic today that said Instagram is the, and I, I knew this already, but it, it just re reaffirms it. Instagram is the second most popular social media site. Now, they didn't include Snapchat, so I don't know if that includes Snapchat. But um, it's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, according to the the people that sent me this infographic. So, so it's basically just Facebook, Facebook, and Twitter. Instagram right, exactly. Is on. That's exactly it. That's right. So, as I mentioned, we have Bridget Mayer with us, and am I screwing this up? No, I'm doing the intro. Okay. I, I always mess this up. Sorry, Bridget. Bridget is the owner of Bridget Mayer Art Gallery, which is in Philly, the 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 city of brotherly love, right? Is it Philly? Yeah. yeah. That's great. And um, you have over 13 years experience in curating exhibitions featuring Philadelphia national and international artists. 16. 16 years. You got to update your LinkedIn. I've been opening business, yeah, on my own. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, Thank you. So we're happy to have you on, and um, you do have quite a story, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, Eugene, fire away. All right. Good morning, Bridget. Good morning, Eugene. Good morning. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your gallery. Sure. So uh, I'm originally from New Jersey. And um, I tell the story of a very difficult childhood in my book that's out right now on Amazon called The Art Cure. And uh, basically, I, I grew up in a very abusive, uh, alcoholic, drug-addicted household with a lot of abandonment. And I won't talk too much about that, but uh, you can read it in the book if you're interested. I was adopted when I was nine years old, went into a new family, learned how to read at that time, and started school at nine. Uh, and, and uh, started to get an education and, and find my place in the world. Fast forward, I went to college and worked in the art world for a few years. And then after a lot of frustration and making less than 10 bucks an hour, I decided after asking myself the very important question of who the heck is making money in my industry, because I was not making money and I had a great resume and I was doing great things for the jobs I was working at, I decided to open up my own art gallery in Philadelphia in 2001, which was right before 9-11. Um, I had about six months worth of savings set up to get me through the first six months and, and really jumped in and, and had a lot of challenges but kept evolving and growing. And fast forward 16 years later, I've built a multi-million dollar business. I have two locations. I'm in Philadelphia and outside of Los Angeles with a private advisory firm. Um, I've done very well financially, and, and, and I love what I do. So that is a small little synopsis of me. So, uh, it's, so sometimes we steer off the subject here, but... Scott, you're frozen. So you said, um, um, oh, you said you had six months of savings when you started. Yeah. Okay. So they yeah. recommend that when you start a business, you have three years of savings. So did, did that scare you a little? <laughs> you know what? Um, what's interesting is uh, I didn't, there was so much I didn't know when I opened the business. Uh, what I knew was, uh, you know, the structure of a gallery, how to run it, how to market it. Um, I had a good aesthetic and an understanding of what artists I thought would do well in the marketplace. But uh, with all the, the finances and the financial part of it, I had no idea until I jumped in. Some so I, I, I quickly learned that yeah, part. That might be the best way to do it. I mean. Yeah, I know. I, I, you know. I look back and I'm like, wow, if I you know, knew what I... Exactly. No, now would I have jumped in the way I did, and I don't think I would have. So, yeah. yeah. But that could be fun, though. Mm -hmm. well, I guess fun is not worry about learning as you go about all the financial stuff when it comes to running a business. Yeah. I try to do my learn QuickBooks and do my taxes in the first year, which I did. And um, I botched that, so I realized quickly I didn't want to spend my time doing bookkeeping and accounting, so I hired 
a bookkeeper and an accountant to work with me. Uh, that was, you know, the, the, those were the first people that I hired. Um, it, it took me almost five years to hire a gallery assistant to actually answer the phone and do the mailings and do some of the admin related work. I was literally doing everything from painting walls to wrapping paintings to putting them in a caravan to deliver them to clients and install them. I was doing all my marketing mailings. I was running my website. This is before social media was really popular like it is now. Uh, the thing that people were focused on in 2001 were their websites. And so my biggest investment in that first year was uh, a website because a lot of the galleries in the marketplace had horrible websites. And I just knew that people were starting to explore going online and looking at art on websites in their homes. So I spent a lot of time and money on my website. Yeah, back then websites were expensive. They were, yeah. So we have to ask before we, before we really get into the interview, what is an art curator? Oh, good question. Um, an art curator is someone that will um, either work in a uh, gallery or a museum situation and often uh, will curate for uh, corporate clients and individuals such as yourself. So Eugene, you could call me and say, hey, Bridget, I have uh, $20,000. I want to start collecting art. I have, nowhere, I, I have no idea where to jump in. Um, I don't even know what type of art I like. And so you and I would sit down and have a conversation. Uh, we would talk about uh, the industry and artists, and I would show you things to start getting a sense of what you might like. Um, and then we would get started and I would, I would basically help you formulate a plan, almost like a business plan, but it's a lot more creative than that for what you're collecting and why. And then I would help find the artists that meet your criteria and basically curate and bring the work into your space. Awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. You know that process works so thank you for that and Scott I do it with a lot of corporate clients a lot of my business uh, clients are in insurance companies or financial firms or law firms where um, they want to think about art collecting and they want some of them want a, what is called more of a legacy art collection where in five to ten years if they're gonna move or grow a location that they have the option to sell or put the collection up for auction and that it's going to have some inherent value in it and a lot of times people just have no idea what to buy and there's a lot in the marketplace so they sometimes they end up buying poster type art that you know in five years they might throw away because it, it hasn't gained value so there, there are many levels of curating and collecting. I, I know an insurance agency that's upgrading your location. Oh awesome. I have a website, it's BridgetMayorArtAdvisors.com, and we work with many budgets, we really do. Scott's actually talking about us, so okay. that's why he mentioned it. <laughs> All right, so Bridget, you described art as an escape. Can you tell us a little bit, a little bit more about that? Um, well, I talk about a story in, in the introduction to my book. Uh, I grew up in this tenement apartment in Jersey City, New Jersey. Hmm. And uh, we would hear gunshots outside of our window. It was a very bad neighborhood. Uh, we were probably one of the few non-Hispanic white families in the neighborhood. And um, my mom would leave us for sometimes a week without food and care. And we didn't have toys. We didn't really have anything in the apartment. It was really stripped down. We had a mattress that her six kids would sleep on. So I was one of six. And... It was horrible, and one day I found um, a bag of makeup in the bathroom, and I didn't know what it was, and I, I opened it up, and there were all these colors and eyeshadows and pink and red lipsticks, and so I uh, took it over to one of the dirty walls and started painting a mural on it, uh, and of course got in trouble, but that was the first time I uh, encountered color uh, material and actually had the ability to have fun and make something and and so when you're making art in in my world with artists you know that's typically a place where 
people feel the most freedom. They can say and express themselves through material in a conversation with what they're painting or sculpting. And most people aren't going to show up and say, oh, that's wrong. So, um, and I, I was getting in trouble constantly. My mom had some mental issues and was really abusive. So anytime we did anything, we'd get in trouble. So making art became a safe place for me and a place that I could really be in my mind and in my inner world and actually express it. I have to tell you, there's not a room in my house that my kids haven't gotten to. So yeah. <laughs> I know I know what that's like. Yeah. As a as a side note, speaking to you actually reminded me in college philosophy, I actually wrote a paper on why you can't call somebody's artwork the S H I T word, and part of the reasons I used was what you just described. Is that it's personal? It's that person. It's what they vision. So you can't really you know call somebody's vision because it's personal to them, S-H-I-T. Yeah, and every artist has their own vision, and I, I coach artists one-on-one -on -one and entrepreneurs, and I teach this that, you know, part of being a creative is defining what your personal vision is for your, your business, and many artists don't see what they're doing as an actual business, um, and so getting people to shift into the mindset of, you know, as an artist, I'm the CEO of my own company, What's my vision for the art that I'm making? What value am I adding into the marketplace? And, and how am I doing it in an authentic way that resonates with the type of art that I'm making? So, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Okay. Sorry, my internet is crazy today. I don't know what's going on. Um, so tell us what it's like owning an art gallery since you do have that passion for art. Yeah, that's an awesome question, and I'm glad you asked it because um, many people walk into an art gallery, and it's a it's a pristine environment. Um, it's my gallery is a beautiful white box space. The architecture is incredible. The lighting's incredible. The art's hung beautifully. Everything looks perfect. Um, and and many people walk into those environments and they think, "Wow, this is easy or looks easy," or "Wow, this must be so much fun." you get to hang pretty pictures and uh, drink wine at openings and have parties once a month. And what a great job you have. And yeah, there are parts of my job that I love and really enjoy, but like any business um, it's, it's challenging and there's a lot of logistics and um, they did a study that in the first uh, uh, one year of business, one out of every three galleries will go out of business. And within the first five years of a business, um, half that number goes up by half. And since I've been open, I've watched, I don't know, 10 galleries open and close within that period of time. So there's a lot involved, such as marketing and how are you going to market yourself? What's your, um, what's your focus with your program and what makes what you're doing different from a gallery across the street where people are going to come to you and know what they're coming to look at and, and eventually buy. Uh, then second, um, there's a lot of relationship building, uh, communication skills that also involve a knowledge of the art market and art history and how an artist fits into a particular uh, context within that. And then, you know, for me, how am I going to take all that information and communicate it on many levels. Some people buy and curate for museums. Some people have never bought a piece of art in their entire life and don't even know what they're looking at. So my range of communication skills has to be broad enough where I'm intuitive and sensitive enough to know what level I need to speak to someone on to actually help them understand what they're looking at. So. There's a lot of, um, and I think where a lot of gallery dealers get stuck is within um, communicating and actually selling to their clients and building a client base uh, based on value and what they're adding to the customer. So probably a lot of art gallery owners probably get in it because they have a passion for art, but they don't realize the other side of the business. Exactly. And, and then also you see a lot of artists that uh, want to open a gallery so that they have a place to show their work. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, and show their friends work, but then again, you get into the business side of it. Uh, I went into someone's gallery in Philadelphia, and it was filthy, and the walls were dirty, and the floor was dirty, and the art wasn't hung well, and that was my first impression. And I was uh, doing some consulting, and I I let the person know, hey, this is my as an art dealer, this is my first impression of your space, and what do you think someone coming in that wants to spend some money is going to think about the environment that they're walking into? So there, there are many elements. And I, I saw um, some of the pictures of your art gallery on Facebook. So you, the, you have a Facebook page, um, Bridget, Bridget Mayer Art Gallery, and it, it looks really, really nice. Next time I'm in Philly, which isn't too often, unfortunately, but next time I'm there, I'll, I'll, have, to, uh, I'll have to stop in. Yeah, um, and I can share with you guys. Um, so I, I've recently changed my my business model to um, from a public gallery after almost 17 years to um, a private gallery, which means that it's open by appointment. Okay. Um, and part of that is for a few reasons. One, the market is shifting primarily online, mm -hmm. and um, I spend a lot of money on running a top-notch gallery, and every month there's uh, a lot of overhead expenses. So I've shifted the model um, because the digital world is really disrupting the art market and art fairs. So I'm, I'm moving into what I see as an ongoing trend where um, I didn't need to run the same level of space. So I have um, a gallery program with 18 artists, but now it'll be open by appointment. So um, if you want to come see the art, you have to make an appointment with me. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of businesses have a hard time with that. And we're seeing it in the cable industry, really, mm -hmm. uh, where they don't understand that it's shifting to a digital yeah. world. And if you're not, if you don't, if you don't recognize that shift and get on board with that shift, you are going to get left behind. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The cable industry is, a, is like the, the biggest example of that right now. Most of, I, you know, when, when you're open after a certain amount of time in an industry, um, hopefully, and in my case, I've established a very hardcore group of about 400 clients that call me all the time. And I've built these relationships with people over a 16 year period. Um, and I would say about 30% of those people, I'm, I'm talking to them um, several times a year. And now uh, shopping for them, helping them with their art collection, and it has absolutely nothing to do with my gallery space anymore. And then there's another segment of the market that's only buying art online now. So there are people that, that email me. I've never met them. We, we spend time over email going back and forth discussing art, and they give me a credit card number. Uh, I transact the sale. We communicate about the shipping, and I ship it. So a lot of art now is being purchased uh, through my website, and for a lot of people, and even Instagram, people seeing stuff on Instagram. Uh, and in my industry, there are trade shows that people go to. So the market's really shifted from – the only place to do business was a white box gallery when I first opened to now there's so many outlets for, for business that don't require a shop or storefront. And a many, many people are not shifting into that model. That's right. Yeah. I don't think I personally would ever buy like a, a artwork of value online. I just, it's be tough. I would need to see it with my own eyes. I, I but, feel the same way. Yeah. It's interesting, and, and um, I never imagined when people were predicting that the industry would move online, we're, we're kind of like more and more moving into that. I never imagined it because I couldn't conceive how someone would want to spend, you know, $10,000 or even $5,000 to buy a piece of art without seeing it first. So um, part of that... Uh, process for me is having incredible photography of the art where people know exactly what they're getting because when you see something online and then you, you're holding it or looking at it in your space, it should match. And sometimes yeah. people don't have great photography. And then secondly, I do, um, I, I have a long conversation with my clients, even if it's over email to determine 
as much as I can about who they are, wh why they're buying, why they like the artist, to make sure it's a good match for them. All good points. Yeah. Points. All right, so, so Bridget, you mentioned this um, about your your stories, a lot of it is overcoming some tough obstacles. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think that's important for you to share. Um, and do you want to do you want to hear about my younger childhood obstacles or my business obstacles? I think uh, childhood, because I think the next questions will get into more about the business obstacles. Um, yeah, I mean, I to grow up in a home where there was abuse and um, parental neglect and and not you know going to school and having an education and I didn't learn how to read until I was uh, seven years old and so that really set me back initially which is probably why I gravitated towards art because it wasn't something I, I could just do it uh, and learn and not have to read a book around it but um, so that that was really challenging for me to step into a school system and for many years of my life, I felt like I was constantly behind my peers. Um, so that was one aspect. And then um, I moved around from foster home to foster home before I was finally adopted. So I had a really hard time trusting people. And that made it challenging, you know, to have friends and um, you know, even as I, I as I got older and just started having relationships with people um, and even business relationships, sometimes I'm really skeptical and I have to catch myself because I know it goes back to my childhood and, and you know, building trust with people. Um, so those are some of the, the challenges that I face that um, – and then the other thing that the major thing that I, I talk about in the book was, uh, you know, for the first nine years of my life, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to speak up. I wasn't allowed to express myself. I wasn't allowed to have opinions. And if I did, I would get beat with a belt or a broomstick. So that was like total conditioning to set me up for, okay, now after I'm adopted and I'm in a school classroom setting, and a teacher asked me a question, I would literally have panic attacks. And I was incredibly shy. I couldn't look people in the eye. I looked down at the floor all the time. I couldn't shake your hand. So my adopted family really had a, a challenge with trying to get me to um, open up and speak up and, and be more confident. And, and so that was one of my greatest challenges when I opened my business. And I, I had no idea that that would actually be come full circle for me and be a challenge for me. Um, I really had to learn how to um, speak my mind and stand up for myself. And that was a very long, intense process for me. Well, I think it's amazing to give you all the credit in the world to come from an upbringing like that in the beginning to actually – be successful because you know your life could take a completely different path and you could just go down a uh, downward spiral so yeah I give you all, it's not tough to come from that and you know make yourself successful yeah well I I um I knew that one of the things I talk about in my book is there's a certain point where um I felt internally probably around five years old that this is not right what's happening to me is not right I knew it, um, and I remember saying to myself, this is not going to be my life, and that became my mantra, and I had a sense that beyond the tenement space we were living in and beyond the gunshots that there was something else for me, and I had a very spiritual sense of it, and and so, um, you know, at that time, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was manifesting what was going to happen in my life by telling myself what was not going to happen for me. That's crazy that started at five years old. Yeah. Already. And then once I once I was adopted, my my thing was like, all right, you never want to go back to that that situation. I don't want to be in poverty anymore. I don't want to get beaten up anymore. Um, and I, I want to enjoy life. So I just kept working really hard to put as much distance between me and my past childhood as I could. And, and that became one of my goals, to supersede it, 
I knew I wanted to go to college and, um, you know, down the road, I then realized, no, I don't want to be a starving artist. I don't want to live this paradigm that the art world is setting up. I do want to have money. I do want to be a millionaire. I do want to be wealthy. And, and so I, I started focusing on stepping into that amazing that is yeah. an awesome story um and it's a nice segue to the next question because you know you hear it a lot where somebody who's in similar situation says there's no way for me to get out i can't you know I, I was born in the inner city i was born into these circumstances and i can't get out it's not going to happen this yeah. is what, this is the life i'm meant to live so what what would you say to someone who believes that way i would say that Every one of us has our own voice inside of us, the true voice that knows what we're destined for or knows what we want. And when you can actually stop, you know, listening to the voices outside of you, you know, for some people, they might be in a gang. They might hang out with horrible people that, that are doing drugs or, you know, they're alcoholics or whatever, they're around bad influences and they want to get away from it, but they can't because all the voices in their life are, um, you know, saying, no, you belong here. This is who you are. We all know who we are deep down inside. And so my thing is listen to that voice. And I started tuning into my inner voice that said, no, you're not going to be this way. You're not going to be your mother. You're not going to be the father you never knew. You're not going to be an alcoholic. You're not a drug addict. That's not your identity. And so for me, it was, well, what is my identity? What do I want to create? And so I, I would tell people that as crazy as it sounds, you can sit down and write out a vision for your life and, and make it the biggest uh, fantastical vision you can come up with. And, um, you know, a friend of mine's like, I want to, I want a helicopter that picks me up for work in, in the morning. Put that in your vision and write, write down how much money you want to make and write down the industry that you really want to be in and why you want to be in it and what you want to do in the industry and read it every day and, and really start reprogramming your mind and, and tapping into, you know, things like I am great, I am amazing, I am successful, I am a millionaire, even if you're not yet. Because that's the language that's going to drive you to make better choices. And if you know you need to get rid of people in your life, just walk away. You're, you have a, everyone has a purpose on being here. And if you're not living into it, you're going to be on your deathbed. And most people, it's not how much money they didn't make. It's what they didn't do and the person that they didn't become. And that's what we all know. Like, are you living your truth? And a lot of people, unfortunately, are not living it because they're not taking the step and, and getting through the fear and just going for it. And so that's a long answer, but that's what I would say. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> that was an awesome answer. That's, that's going to be our success hack. I don't know how I'm going to fit it onto one little image, but that'll be the <laughs> success hack. I'll figure it out. All right. So, you know, we talked about challenges based on your, your personal life, but when you started in the art world, what are some challenges that you had to overcome just specifically related to the art world? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, the art world is a funky place. And, and then you go into a market like Philadelphia, which when I was in the marketplace working for a year, I didn't know about the market. And it's, um, it's different from New York City. And it's different from other places in the world. Every city has a different feeling and a different way that the art economy is being run or not being run. Um, and so I came into the, the city of Philadelphia with this incredible track record in history. And I've worked for great galleries. I worked at a few museums. And um, I was incredibly young. I was 26 when I started my business. And I looked younger than that. And people would come in and say, who are you? Where are you from? Are you from Philadelphia? No, I'm not from Philadelphia. Okay, well, we want to support someone from Philadelphia. And so one of my initial challenges was the fact that, you know, I wasn't born in Philadelphia. I didn't have any family there. I didn't have any family in the art world, really. So I didn't have people that were supporting me saying or validating me. So I had to start creating my own um, validation through 
um, the quality of everything I was doing with my marketing and my business. And then people were uh, reading about me in, in the press. Uh, so that was a very a strong initial challenge for me. And then uh, the second challenge was I was in a, a, a neighborhood that wasn't developed yet. So um, uh, there weren't galleries around me. And so I really had to work to create this destination space that people wanted to come to. So that became another marketing challenge. Um, how to pull people from downtown or uptown to the middle of the city to come into the space that uh, wasn't a popular art area. So that was another initial challenge I had. Um, and then I would say that the third challenge was I was working with artists who were very young coming out of graduate school that didn't have a track record yet. I didn't have a track record yet. So a lot of people were very sensitive with um, spending their money in my gallery initially. And I had to work really hard for the sales that I made. And I had to work really hard to promote and figure out how to pump up the artists I was working with and how to keep putting them in opportunities that would grow their resume so that people would start respecting them enough to actually buy the work. I could see the talent, but and, and, and people that collected art could see the talent, but in my industry, people want to know that there's a resume and what they're buying and that the artist is going to be around in the next five years. I had a client that came in for five years before he bought anything. Wow. And finally, I just said, you know, you come in, I spend at least an hour every time talking to you. What, what do you need to see to actually spend some money here? Like, what are you concerned about? And I put them on the spot. And I started shifting my conversations with people. And because I realized, like, I can have an hour-long conversation around art and have it be a pretty and nice conversation and a polite conversation. But... I'm not doing my job for myself or the artist if I'm not asking someone why they're not buying from me. So I, I finally just started getting a little bit less timid and more bold in my, my selling. And just I started calling people out and asking them direct questions. And I started learning some great things like, all right, well, I bought from a gallery a year after they opened. And then the next year they were out of business. And I didn't like that. And, and so people were starting to share why they weren't buying and what they needed to see. And then I soon discovered that some of it was actually budget and um, they didn't want to spend that type of money yet. So then I started working with people around payment plans and ways to get them to start buying or shifting their focus into buying something smaller. So it became this um, discovery. So I, there are a lot of challenges. They usually are in business. There's well, all business. A lot of challenges. I am um, in my first um, two years, I, I ran a really lean business. I didn't have a lot of extraneous things. I really focused on staying in business. So I stripped out anything that was unnecessary. Uh, and then what I realized is that I was living um, in an apartment a few blocks away from the gallery. And my gallery building had a lower level, a basement with a, a kitchen and a bathroom. And yeah, it was part of my rent. So I decided to get rid of my apartment uh, and move into my basement. And that was a huge move for me. And I wasn't happy about it. But what I decided to do was take the money I was spending on my apartment and literally every month dump it into advertising so that people outside of Philadelphia could start learning about me. So I started doing ads in art magazines and that started bringing more people in. So it was worth it. Ads work, you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sacrificed a lot. <laughs> loves ads, especially if they start with Google. <laughs> now it's different. I mean, um, in 2001, 2002, people were doing print ads. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a gallery, most galleries weren't advertising because they couldn't afford it. So I wanted to set myself apart uh, with people seeing my name every month. So um, having that print ad is now what people do online with Google ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I also noticed you have quite a few awards and uh, recognitions. Can you tell us about some of those, Some of your maybe some of your favorite awards? Um, 
Yeah, sure. One of, probably one of my favorite awards was um, a business award that I won in Philadelphia a few years ago uh, that was called 40 Under 40. Um, well and the, the uh, Business Journal of Philadelphia um, has a very stringent process of um, uh, selecting 40 people in business under 40 years old. And they, they typically get four to 500 regional people applying a year. And so I, I spent a lot of time working on this application. And part of this application is what your business does in the community besides being its own business and, and adding money into the, um, the, the city structure, but what you do to give back to the community. And I had done years of fundraising for nonprofits in Philadelphia and, and raised, I've raised over 100000 with different fundraising things through artwork in my gallery. So that was part of my application. Uh, and I was really proud of it. And, and I was selected um, as one of the 40 under 40 and got to give a presentation and um, be in front of a group of a thousand people getting recognized with the award. So that was really exciting for me. Um, it was, yeah, then, it was you know, go ahead. I was saying we have the 40 under 40 in Connecticut too. Do you? Yeah. Um, I was recognized by the New York Times Magazine as an arts destination in Philadelphia. Uh, and that, for me, was also a really big deal because that was part of my dream, to be considered the top gallery in Philadelphia and the arts destination besides the great museums we have. And that, so they recognized the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Institute of Contemporary Art, the Barnes Museum in Philadelphia, and then me. So that was incredibly exciting for me. That's all. Um, yeah. Um, I was recognized by um, uh, a very well-regarded art magazine as uh, one of the top 500 galleries in the world. And there are millions of galleries around this world. So to be put into a top 500 with um, galleries in New York and London, Germany, and all over the world was very exciting for me. Uh, so those were a few. And then probably the most exciting moment for me was being um, uh, on Anderson Cooper's program uh, in 2006 called On the Rise. And he was profiling young business owners who were doing great things in their industry. And they found an article about me and, and his team came out to spend the day uh, shadowing me, going to meetings with me. And, and then they did a story about me. And that was really exciting. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Those are some awesome awards. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So it's obviously that you are successful in, in your business. Um, what do you attribute to that success? What would you say is the key thing that you attribute to all the success you've achieved? Wow. All of it. Um, relenting, relentless hard work. I got I'm not afraid to work very hard. Uh, I, when I started, I was working 60 hour work weeks and really through sheer determination, I made a lot happen. And I think sometimes people give up before things are about to happen for them. And I've always continued to work hard. Um, I set new goals every twice a year and I look at them and their goals for my business, their goals for me personally, their goals for the artists that I'm working with. Um, and I work on them. And I, I'm lucky that I love what I do. So it doesn't even feel like work to me. I'm just really compelled to do it. So I would say really a drive and a determination and hard work is what has really kept me going. I, I sometimes think that entrepreneurs, um, they have great ideas. They think they know what the business is that they want to be in, but then they don't want to do the work. They just think, oh, because I put it out there, people are going to show up and I'm going to make money. But that's not how it works. And the most successful people are grinding all the time. And, you know, you guys are grinding. I'm grinding because I, I love what I do and I want to be successful. So it does take a lot of work to own your own business. Yeah, yes. people always fail in the execution. That's where a lot of people fail. I mean, they, like you said, everybody has a grand idea, but yeah, no, a lot of very few people actually go out and execute it. 
don't know. Yeah. I don't know who who came up with that saying. If you build it, they will come because that's so false. <laughs> no. Wasn't that in a baseball movie? Yeah. Oh, that's right. It was. Yes. Feel the dreams. Feel the dreams. And I love baseball. I should know that. I, I will say, though, I love that quote because um, you do have to build something for people to show up. And some people are building stuff in their minds and they're building it on paper, but they won't take the next step of putting it out into the world. So, yeah, build it, but then work your ass off. Yes. Mm-hmm. And market it. You need to market yeah, it. Yeah, and market it. I love marketing. Um, what message would you give to someone who wanted to get into the art business? Probably the um, same, right? That's a good question. I would say learn as much as you can from the marketplace before you get into it. Um, I, I really started out. I worked in the industry from 1992 until 2001 when I opened my business. So um, I had, I don't know, eight, nine years worth of experience in on every level, nonprofit art, museum, uh, curating art, gallery work. Uh, I worked in an architectural firm. So I would say do as much homework as you can because what you think you're getting into might be different from what the truth is and what the reality is. And, and this is where people in the art world get into trouble. Artists get into trouble with it too. Artists spend lots of money to go to grad school. You, know, you might spend sixty dollars to $80,000 to get an MFA degree. And then you come out and they did a study that um, after the first five years, only one out of seven artists was still actively making art in the industry after investing money on getting an MBA. Um, And so my my thing is, well, what now you're stuck with all these bills and and loans and, and you're in a different industry and you're not even making art anymore. So if they had known that from the outset, if they had done their due diligence, they might not have gotten into it. So I would say do your research, do your homework, talk to people. Uh, there aren't many books in it. I'm writing a book around it right now uh, to educate people and and just learn as much as you can before jumping in. So Scott, I think I found our success hack. Homework <laughs> never goes away. No, it really doesn't. You have and you have to it continually do it even after you're in the business. You yep. still have to do homework. Uh, well, you guys been- know this from a marketing standpoint. Yeah. Like our world is moving so fast right now that something that was in six months ago around marketing doesn't work that's anymore. Right. That's exactly and something it. else is working, and that's why I love working with experts that are researching and studying a particular industry because I want to accelerate myself, and someone like you guys can help someone accelerate what they're doing. Where part of doing your homework is working with the right people in marketing. So there's so much to learn all the time. Yep. Never stop learning. Yeah. All right. So, Bridget, what's next for you? What's your future goals? Well, she just wow. she's writing a new book. So, I'm writing a new book um, for artists and gallery owners um, on how to run a successful art business. Um, I recently started coaching a few days a week. Um, I'm coaching a few artists. Uh, that are outside of my gallery program. I'm coaching a few business owners that want to open in galleries. Um, and so I'm working on that. Um, and I'm really just continuing to grow my current gallery and art advising business. And I'm really working on disrupting my marketplace with what I'm doing. That's my goal. Um, a lot of people, there's a one belief in my industry is that and artists have it, and, and gallery owners have it, that you can't be successful in the industry without having a white box space. Part of my success has been looking beyond the walls of my business to see where I can go and what I can do that's not in my industry that would take my artists and myself into new industries. So that, to me, is disrupting a market, and so that's what I'm working on right now. Awesome. We're looking forward to yeah. that. Thank you. So we're going to give you 30 seconds here, sales pitch. Why should someone buy art or, or have their art have art curated through Bridget Mayer? Oh, why should you have your art or curated? Or if you want to do the book, we can do the book, either one. No, I, I'd prefer to talk to your audience about why they should work with me. Okay. Um, there is so much to know about in the art world. And what happens is that people come to me 
uh, after buying art for five years and they've realized how much money they've spent and how many mistakes they've made and they hire me to help them fix their problems and actually clean up uh, their art collection, sell art for them and then reimagine what uh, they want to collect and how they want to spend their money. And part of spending money is spending it wisely and, and for me, um, buying good art, that's a good investment. Um, so I would love to help your audience with really formulating what's possible for them within having beautiful art in their homes and their offices that makes sense to them and their family that's within a great budget that works for them and to grow the relationship with them where, you know, in 10, 15 years, I'm there helping them figure out what to do next and, um, and that some of them are creating legacies not only for their company but for their children. So I, I'm really passionate about working with my clients and helping them achieve and define what they want to do in the art marketplace. That was a good sales pitch. Thank you. Yeah. So we have this thing we do every show as well. It's called the fire round, and it's four really quick questions. You know, it's almost like you're you're going to be on the Supreme Court or something. Ooh. No, they're not that hard. Um, Are you guys the Supreme Court? Yes. No. I, no. Yes. <laughs> no. Um, we're more like people's court maybe, but, uh, <laughs> um, so four quick questions. Eugene's got the first one. Go. All right. Contemporary or classic? Contemporary. Okay. Painting, sculpture, or photos? Painting, please. Okay. Most quick. Biggest passion outside of your business? Woo! Yoga and fitness and juicing. Okay. Oh, we should introduce her to Travis. Too bad you're not in Connecticut. Oh, uh, my husband and I are opening a franchise where we are. It's a new business for us. Um, it's going to be a Robex juice bar, and okay. they just opened one in Connecticut. Is that what he does? No, well, he has. He's an independent. He's not a yeah. It's it's okay, called cool. Palace, Palace, but a lot of it is uh, juices and and uh, yeah, I love it. Movies. Yeah, I think there is. I think I recall seeing a Robex on mm -hmm. the highway in Connecticut. Yeah. They're awesome, and then we're opening one in our area. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, best business advice you have received ever? Um, best business advice was from my dad. He said, decide what you want to do, um, learn everything about it, be passionate about it, and work really hard. Oh, so it's not fake it till you make it. Oh. <laughs> well, you can do that too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Bridget, hold up the book again. <laughs> All right, The Art Cure by Bridget Mayer. Go get it, everybody. Uh, yes. is, is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. And is it is in the bookstores? Because I know Amazon takes a big piece of it. They do. It's not in the bookstores yet. Okay. And it's also on my website. It's on your Bridget website. So go to Bridget. Bridget what is the Mayer. website? Com. Yeah. BridgetMayer.com? Yeah. Okay, so go to BridgetMayer.com and get the book there so that Amazon doesn't get all that money. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that live, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get shut down. Thanks, Scott. No, no problem. <laughs> they can't get me. <laughs> well, tell them that if they sponsor your show, you'll be happy to say great things. There you go. Yeah. That, I, Amazon is a sponsor. I'll take it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I thought you might. <laughs> yeah, I would too. So, Eugene, who do we have on next week for episode fifty-one? All right, next week at Friday, eleven o'clock, like always, we have Joe Fournier. He's a business attorney, and he's going to talk to us about the new department of labor regulations that came out, which are huge for anybody that's either a business owner or even employees, because it's all about how you get paid and how to pay your people. Awesome. Awesome. Bridget, thank you again for joining us. And if, if people want to get a hold of you, they can go to BridgetMayor.com? Yes. That's absolutely. the best way? Yeah, and I hope they do. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So go get the book, everybody. And you guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. I love this interview. It was great. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. And everybody have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, guys. Thank you.